Good evening and welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Dr. Chris Pelt. I'm from the University of Utah, uh, broadcasting here in Park City, and I am uh, delighted to have you all join us for this evening's um, master class on Orem technology uh, and the implant and uh, technology that's been designed by Total Joint Orthopedics. I think it's a really uh, timely subject as we continue to look for answers in the uh, ongoing issue of metallosis, as well as uh, allergy sensitivity, but also a premium bearing option that may even start to get at some of these issues that we continue to struggle with in the issues of uh, satisfaction following total knee arthroplasty. I, uh, I wanna just make note that uh, there's a category four hurricane making landfall in uh, Florida right now. So our thoughts go out to all of our uh, participants that uh, may not be able to join us, but might view us at a later time and all of our colleagues down in Florida. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Dr. Bolognese, uh, a good friend and colleague uh, from Duke University who was on the panel for tonight. He's had some flight cancellations in part related to the storm uh, and the impacts that it's had in the uh, uh, air, air transport today. Uh, he will not be able to join us. So I'm gonna take over for both the first uh, presentation as well as the moderator for the course. I would like to introduce the two other panelists that are uh, joining us today. I'm really uh, excited to have them both with us. Uh, first is Dr. Wesley uh, Lackey. Uh, Dr. Lackey is an orthopedic surgeon and the co-founder of the Midwest Center for Joint Replacement, serving patients in the Indianapolis and Bloomington, Indiana uh, area. So thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Lackey. Also joining us tonight is uh, Dr. David Doherty. Dr. Doherty is an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at McGovern Medical School at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston at UT Health. And the combination of the talks tonight, I think, really puts together a very nice discussion around the Orem technology, uh, the, the role of uh, sort of a, an intelligent design um, and efficiencies that can be inherently added to our operating rooms to help uh, improve both our lives as well as the lives of our patients. I'm gonna start with the first presentation tonight. So I have sort of a, a two-part task, um, partly taking over Dr. Bolognese's role a little bit, but also um, it's trying to help establish a little bit of what my philosophies and thought process around eliminating cobalt chrome and total knee arthroplasty is and why I think we are headed that way in uh, joint replacement. And then I'm gonna introduce and talk to you a little bit about the Orem technology that uh, Total Joint Orthopedics has come out with. I do have some relevant disclosures, that most importantly being that I am a consultant and do receive royalties, and I'm on the universal design team for Total Joint Orthopedics. I do work with other companies that are, some of them are listed uh, below. So first of all, why do we need an alternative to cobalt chrome? Uh, I think it's important always when we talk about orthopedics and material properties and what we're doing is to think about the history. Uh, cobalt chrome was really kind of uh, discovered in the early 1900s by fusing cobalt and chromium together. The alloy was discovered with many other elements such as tungsten and molybdenum to be present in it. And Elwood Haynes kind of uh, reported that the uh, alloy was capable of resisting oxidation and corrosive fumes existed and exhibited no visible signs of tarnish. It became intriguing in the medical uh, device area era. In 1960s, it was first implanted in prosthetic heart valves, interestingly, and lasted uh, for many years, including in the 1990s, still showing high resistance to wear. And due to its excellent resistant properties, the biocompatibility, high melting points, and incredible strength, even at high temperatures, cobalt chrome alloys were found to be a suitable uh, use uh, for material and joint replacement. It demonstrated some resistance to corrosion uh, due to the spontaneous formation of the protective passive layer of chromium oxide. So if we have such a great option, why are we getting rid of it? And I think most of us that do total knee replacement also uh, have done or trained in or uh, currently do total hip replacement and even revision total hip replacement. And many of us have seen a dramatic shift away from the use of cobalt chromium and total hip replacement. We haven't quite seen that yet in total knee arthroplasty. And maybe that's because we haven't realized some of the detriment or seen some of the problems or understood what it is. Similar to that, in my opinion, to what we were seeing in the early 2000s when we didn't really know what the problem that was brewing was. Uh, with cobalt chrome in general, not just in hip replacement, but in all parts of the body, we can see issues with cor uh, corrosion, mechanical acid crevice corrosion at taper junctions, some local toxicities, adverse local tissue responses. I'm going to talk just briefly about allergy and hypersensitivity, and then we're going to hear another talk about it later. The issue of wear, also the issue of infection has been brought up. Um, and some of the advantages to the use of ceramics and total hip arthroplasty. And I'll show a couple examples of how I think that might also translate into the knee world and the systemic effects of cobalt chrome ions 
I'm only going to mention cancer once. We really don't have any good clinical data suggesting it other than free uh, cobalt powders. But it is important to note that our European colleagues are now having to add a label uh, to their packaging uh, for any implants containing cobalt chromium as a potential carcinogen. Um, some of the examples on the right-hand side showing large diameter metal on metal and dual modular junction total hip arthroplasty. Some of the areas where I started to really become a, uh, keened in on the issue of cobalt chrome and how I've started to translate some of those findings to the air, uh, to the world of knee replacement. As I mentioned, all of us have seen this dramatic shift. This was the 2021 AGRR report, which is the most recently available publication. And you can see that dramatic change in the crossover point happening around 2014, where dramatic increases in the utilization of ceramics occurred at the same time as the dramatic decreasing utilization of cobalt chrome. It may have been popular at the beginning of my career to do demand matching based on the patient's age or their insurance or where I was operating to use cobalt chrome versus ceramic, whereas I use 100% ceramic heads in the uh, setting of total, total hip arthroplasty for many reasons, corrosion only being one of uh, uh, several of the reasons that I think many of us have uh, moved away from the use of cobalt chrome. So as I mentioned all that list above, many people are saying, aren't those just total hip arthroplasty issues? And my argument is no. I wanna address the elephant in the room first when we're talking about alternatives to the cobalt chrome in the, in the setting of total knee arthroplasty, and that is that of uh, metal sensitivity or allergy. That's the most common use uh, for alternatives to cobalt chrome. If you look at what the indications for alternatives in total knee arthroplasty currently exist are, I think it's still a relatively controversial topic. I think metal sensitivity has been shown to be a potential uh, real issue, a type four hypersensitivity. None of the tests that we have existing are actually validated. Skin patch testing, I'll get to in just a second. I don't think really is a great test uh, for someone with a deep organ space um, orthopedic device or implant. And then the issues of lymphocyte transformation tests, there's a couple commercially available. And we've seen examples in our own practice as well as other colleagues uh, where you can get a uh, same uh, patient do the lymphocyte transfer transformation test and the other alternative option. And both of them will have exactly opposite uh, answers. And I'm not convinced that I know exactly um, what to do with that information. It does make a little bit of sense to take the patient's blood cells and react them. We don't really know what to do with it. Ultimately, if you really think about it, we talk about nickel allergy and setting a total knee. A cobalt chrome implant actually only contains 0.4% of nickel. The stainless steel implants that we commonly use in our trauma world contain 13% nickel. And we very rarely discuss the issue of pain after uh, you know, fracture fixation being related to nickel allergy. On rare occasion, we might see an indication for alternatives like titanium over a, uh, a stainless steel implant, but it's rare. And again, getting to this issue of the skin being a poor surrogate, in my opinion, it's a very different immune system. It's the barrier to the outside world, to our inside world. It has Langerhans cells, dermal dendrocytic cells, and these different ways of uh, keeping bacteria, viruses, and other foreign materials out of our inside space. And it's just not the same immune system. So I think skin patch testing doesn't really hold a lot of weight in my practice, at least uh, for diagnosing the issue of allergy. But I get to the issue of, is it real? Uh, in this particular uh, publication, kind of looking at it, talking about although cutaneous and systemic hypersensitivity to metal has arisen, there is increasing concern after joint replacements, but allergies against implant materials remain quite rare and are not a well-known problem. And I just want to take it back to the hip world. Um, we've seen a couple of recent uh, publications talking about our instruments. We use stainless steel blades and other instruments in total hip arthroplasty as well. The issue of our uh, saw blades and our instrument cutting guides uh, creating metal debris at the time of doing the total knee arthroplasty probably gets washed out by our body. And that's not really where I think we should be focused, but really on the long-term benefits and long-term effects of cobalt chrome in the body. And if you talked about the hip world, and you had a metal on poly total hip arthroplasty as uh, was a patient of mine that I revised a few years back and had this massive pseudo tumor as a result of likely corrosion at the taper junction. Um, there's very few of us that probably would have said, oh, this patient's pain and swelling in the hip must be related to a nickel allergy. It's almost mind boggling that any of us would think that today. I very rarely would bring up nickel allergy in the setting of a diagnostic workup of a patient's issues with painful total arthroplasty. And yet that's one of the most common things we jump to a conclusion in total knee arthroplasty. So does corrosion occur in total knee arthroplasty? I talked about it in total hip. My answer is yes. Uh, modular junctions, particularly in revision total knee arthroplasty, are common and prevalent. There's various ways we obtain fixation. Certain, uh, I think, in implants are a little bit higher risk, where we um, actually do a sort of poor job of cementing in an effort to try to improve sort of zone two metaphyseal fixation. 
we can see erosion, as you can see in this uh, picture of the uh, bone from underneath the cement that was probably adherent or at least adjacent to the bone at one time. And now we have a dangling large lever arm of the entire weight of the leg on a tapered junction. This is a case of mine I did a few uh, months ago of a pseudo tumor actually that had formed in this patient, uh, negative infectious workup. Uh, we weren't able to get synovial fluid uh, metal ions. What you can see in this video is uh, this sort of cystic uh, and solid pseudo tumor that was directly adjacent to the uh, corrosion occurring from the uh, well ingrown, but uh, cobalt chrome through titanium junction where corrosion can occur, where there can be micro motion. Other areas of uh, revision told arthroplasty with stems, we all use uh, some sort of stem likely in our revision setting. Some of them being fully cemented, I think a little even higher risk is the non-cemented where we try to get fixation and diaphysis, don't have cement supporting the modular junction. And if we get loosening or any changes distally, uh, now we have stresses on a Morris taper. And a couple of uh, papers that uh, Guo Chin Li and his uh, uh, team have been a part of showing that there can be uh, corrosion, fretting and material loss at these modular junctions in the setting of revision total knee arthroplasty. One more sort of similar example to the case that I show with the video, this is a different patient, but a very similar scenario where we had uh, well-fixed implants with good osseous integration in zone two, but what you can see is corrosion occurring of the base plate that doesn't have a lot of epiphyseal segment fixation sitting in trying to dangle inside of a uh, titanium uh, sleeve and significant corrosion demonstrated at, the, at that conical junction and the uh, pseudotumorous tissue that was excised at the time. All right, so I mentioned it's in uh, modular junctions. We don't have modular junctions in primary total knee arthroplasty. So why the heck am I talking about it in primary knee replacement if that's the solution that I'm sort of getting to here? Well, I would argue that we still have cobalt chrome in the body, even if it's not a modular junction. And even in the setting of primary total knee arthroplasty, elevated metal ions in the setting of unilateral and bilateral total knee arthroplasty have been demonstrated in multiple uh, sort of case series and other um, sort of prospective and retrospective studies. This is just one example that was published in CORE in 2007. Here's another example. Cobalt levels were low. Many of us would use a, 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 a number or a threshold of concern about metal ions of one microgram per liter in the uh, blood as being concerning, but all of them were elevated compared to controls, um, although less than one in this particular study. And the authors questioned what the potential local effects of metal ions uh, uh, being released from the primary knee replacements could be. There is surface damage of cobalt chrome uh, implants, even without modular junction. Surface damage, corrosion, and cobalt chrome debris was seen in 98% of retrievals in this particular uh, publication. And a 12% by weight of wear products were actually metallic wear products, not just polyethylene wear. As we might imagine, we see that scratching um, that we all can see on the ends of cobalt chrome implants. Uh, yes, it's going to wear the polyethylene and create poly debris, but there's metal debris that's also being released in the setting of scratching as well. And there could be, you know, potentially immunotoxic effects and maybe even some of these issues of pain, swelling, this sort of elusive uh, effusion in the patients with the painful total knee that we can't kind of, kind of diagnose. So what about infection? I mentioned this earlier. The dental world is always an interesting area to go. We've heard the, the um, recent sort of uh, potential theories, as best I could put them, about the uh, ceramics and total hip arthroplasty, potentially a little uh, improved wettability, reduced surface adhesion of the bacteria or biofilm, maybe reducing the local tissue toxicity by the lack of cobalt chrome toxicity, creating the immunomodulation, decreased wear, um, leading to a little lower particulate load, therefore a little less inflamed uh, joint environment. There's a lot of theories. Uh, this is an example in dental world of a titanium nitride. And I bring this up because this is where we're getting into this discussion on the ORM uh, technology and total arthroplasty as total, uh, total joint orthopedics has come out with. It's a titanium nitride, perhaps a little bit different than the one used in the dental world. But you can see here significantly lower amounts uh, and adhesion of biofilms to the Tainai surface substrate compared to the titanium substrate of the dental implants. So what about the role of materials? I just bring up this little uh, graphic that I got on the email just before this that's also being released by orthopedics this week, uh, I think in the coming weeks, about implant alignment. This is from a different company, obviously, but we all know about dissatisfaction in this 20% group of patients that we have after total knee arthroplasty. And we often talk about a lot of alternative factors, kinematic alignment versus mechanical alignment, the type of soft tissue balancing, the use of robotics, the type of fixation with cement, 
cementless hybrid, the kinematics of the joint, um, the PS versus congruent versus CR, bearing designs, et cetera. All of these are factors being discussed. What you rarely hear discussed um, are the material properties uh, that may affect the issues that I talked about with the amino uh, modulation and potential pain sources. So just like Indiana Jones searching for the uh, ideal uh, material or gold here, um, just because we stumbled on a cobalt chrome in the 1960s and told me arthroplasty doesn't really mean we discovered the best material. And my opinion is it might be time to reassess the role of the material being used in total arthroplasty as one more of those variables as we try to attack that 15 to 20% dissatisfaction rate, improve outcomes, longevity, and improvement in wear. Um, how does it present as far as uh, metal issues? If we talked about you know, pain, um, that's really it in my opinion. We talk about the hypersensitivity with the cutaneous reaction. Again, it's very rare. What is very common in my um, revision arthroplasty uh, referral practice to see patients with that painful uh, total knee replacement with swelling and not, not really a better diagnosis. I've started to think about the metal issue a little bit more, and that's really how some of these patients have been shown in this particular publication. Just a case series, six uh, knees talking about a painful effusion of cobalt chromium. Stephen Tower is an interesting guy. He's one of us. Uh, he's lived this and uh, had metal on metal tolip arthroplasty. You can see his story. Um, if you go to uh, anywhere on the internet, he's got it. He's, uh, he's part of the documentary of The Bleeding Edge uh, that's in Netflix and has a uh, you know, uh, very high uh, view rate. He's published uh, uh, multiply and he's talked about it on his own on the circuit with TED Talks and has been published in the New York Times. He's somebody that we ought to listen to and he's pretty thoughtful about this issue. Um, and he's published this in JAMA. I think we're gonna hear about this again. But we he's broken this down into extreme risk joint replacements being metal on metal total hip arthroplasty, high risk including bilateral total knee arthroplasty primaries, and then low risk including ceramic on poly as well as the uh, unilateral primary cobalt chrome. Cobalt chrome in the blood can be um, shown in any of these uh, uh, risk categories. The higher risk being the most. Um, but one of the most concerning things is even with very low numbers, as low as 1.1 uh, parts per billion in the urine and 4.1. Um, we can see cobalt-related encephalopathy. He's talked about this a lot with some studies that he's done with um, FDG PET brain scan imaging, talking about various tiers, but significant hypometabolism being seen in the brain with increasing levels of cobalt and chromium. We've talked about you know, cardiac, myop cardiac myop myopathies, uh, sensory differences. Uh, one of the ways that Stephen recognized his own uh, metallosis disease was the fact that he had really a, sort of a, a mental and psychotic factor that really uh, changed his life when he got his uh, revisions and had decreasing loads. Um, his, his mentation improved and he's moved on to now trying to help uh, kind of get at this issue for all of us. So now I'm going to finally focus on what is Orem. Is there a solution to all of this? We've heard about alternative bearings, as I mentioned, mostly for allergy. This is a different option, okay? And it's, I think, an improved option. It's a superior option than the others that existed for multiple reasons. It's an ion-bombarded, ballistically bonded tinitride coating. It establishes this ceramicized coating that we've heard about with other implants, but it's stronger, it's more scratch-proof than cobalt chrome. Um, it's able to resist um, forces um, to prevent breakage and also resist scratching and decreases wear. Why is it better and how is it better than the other Tainai coatings? It's not a coating, it's a surface transformation. It doesn't add any of the cobalt chrome or nickel sensitizers. And it does this by taking this um, ion beam uh, enhanced deposition process and ballistically bonding or a surface transformation. It's not a coating, but it's surfacely transforming uh, the surface of titanium substrate, this Tyl substrate with this IBED technology. And the way it's doing this is taking nitrogen ion beams and a titanium evaporant and not baking it on. It's not a heat or thermal process, but it's rather an energy process. It's ballistically uh, bonding it with kinetic energy and slamming these ions against the titanium alloy. Um, and that creates the surface transformation as opposed to just a coating that can flake or chip off. So it demonstrates very good surface uh, 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 hardness, it's durable and exceptional wear properties. Is it a good solution? As I mentioned, it's strong. So we've cycled it in Instron machines to 3000 Newtons and it demonstrates um, adequate as, if, as well as enhanced um, uh, durability compared to cobalt chrome. And this is an example of cobalt chrome on a block that's been cycled uh, with 400 grit uh, sandpaper. This is Orem, the titanium nitride uh, Orem technology from Total Joint Orthopedics that's also been cycled 
the same number of cycles, the same grit surface uh, of sandpaper, and you can barely see a scratch. Uh, you can see the you know sort of full reflection of the uh, of the engineer here with their iPhone. It looks like this when you look at it on a uh, scratch um, uh, graph. When you put it in a wear simulator against polyethylene, unscratched cobalt chrome versus unscratched aurum, it already looks better. Now you scratch it, aurum looks dramatically better, statistically significant improvements in wear when you add scratching. And that's basically kind of simulating what it would be like to have this implant embedded in a human for a long period of time. Even taking a ceramic pin and literally trying to like grind the surface down Titanium is a soft substrate, right? So it is easy to scratch. Cobalt chrome is more resistant. That's kind of how we settled onto it. It's a pretty durable surface, but as we have shown, it's easy to scratch despite that durability. Well, you do this iBed Titanite um, surface transformation with the Orem technology, it's even better than that of cobalt chrome and resisting the scratch of a cobalt, uh, sorry, a ceramic pin grinding against the surface. As I mentioned, there are other alternatives, um, whether it's from uh, the Oxidium Ion Guard Titanite, seven layer surface wrapping of cobalt chrome as a substrate that may have some issues uh, with some flaking as we've been demonstrated some case series. This is an example of my um, own revision of a case of what the ion guard surface uh, that it was used that got aseptically loosened. There was particulate and third body debris from the abrasive wear of uh, cement on the backside that got into it. And it's really, really poor. It's a resistance at scratching when you add um, sort of the abrasion, as you saw with the ORM technology and even using sandpaper directly against it, it's quite resistant to surface scratching. And again, that gets to this ballistically bonded zone. It's an additive five micron layer surface transformation above that, um, which is different than other alternatives on the market. And then that's just one more snapshot of that exact same picture. I've shown how they perform that with that ballistically bonded zone by the kinetic energy. So in summary, uh, cobalt chrome may have additional problems that we haven't fully recognized, potentially due to our lack of awareness. And my most, you know, sort of relevant sort of analogy that I could come up with is that of our era of the early 2000s in cobalt chrome, metal on poly total hip arthroplasty, metal on metal total hip arthroplasty, the modular junctions of dual modular taper total hip arthroplasties. And why is it any different on the other side of the femur and the hip? When we're talking about a knee, flip the world upside down, and now we're in the knee, and these issues are probably there. We just haven't really thought a lot about it or done a lot of studies. But if I showed you, as I have shown you, there are sub, uh, several studies that demonstrate metal ions, debris, scratching, and cobalt chrome. And this may not be the superior option, not just for allergy issues, uh, but also as a durable sort of long term solution, a high performance bearing option to help improve our outcomes in total knee arthroplasty. Thanks so much. So after that uh, uh, rapid fire uh, review of, um, of what Orem is, I'd really like to now introduce Dr. Uh, Wesley Lackey, uh, again, of uh, Midwest Center for Joint Replacement. And he's going to talk to us a little bit more about his um, uh, use of uh, the uh, uh, total joint orthopedics implant, the, um, the one knee system and uh, his use of Orem even in his private practice setting. So thanks, Dr. Lackey. Thanks, Dr. Pelt. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about Orem and uh, the classic knee in general in the ASC setting. Uh, my disclosures uh, relevant is that I consult and design with Total Joint Orthopedics. Um, so last week was CST week. And so in addition to lots of treats and cookies around the hospital and surgery center, there were memes flowing. And uh, this is when I pulled uh, surgeons be like, why are my turnover times so high? Um, it doesn't matter if you're private or group or employed or in an ASC setting or a hospital setting, um, there is value in simplicity of performing our craft. And so um, uh, I would argue that you don't need uh, 70 trays and 15 femur options and that kind of stuff to perform a simple total knee arthroplasty and get a great outcome. And the classic knee system, I think, is a fantastic workhorse in any setting uh, because it, uh, with um, one set of instrumentation, you can move back and forth between many options. You can do a cementless total knee, you can do a cemented total knee, you can do a CR or a PS, you can cut a box or not and use an ultra congruent uh, 
FPS technique bearing. Uh, you can use a titanium or an all poly tibia. You can add stems um, and do a fair number of revisions at this point, more to come later on that. Um, so whether it's primary complex, uh, Pri complex primary, uh, some revisions, or even uh, this all poly tibia, which is a go-to, especially the ultra congruent version, uh, is a go-to antibiotic spacer for us. Um, it's been a great system. And now adding Orum to that has been a fantastic addition, particularly for us in our ASCs. Um, when we have the patients with the mysterious uh, uh, metal allergy, um, I always tell them, that uh, I don't think that I've ever truly seen a, a true metal allergy, but I do agree with the um, the the problems with cobalt chrome, the um, uh, the unanswered questions about patient satisfaction, the knee that looks great but feels bad, um, and so in the past we would go to an alternative bearing surface, which um, would. Uh, double or triple the price of the implant. And so that was a, a high cost to pay for really treating the patient's brain more than their knee. Um, uh, but this has been a great option. We do have a, an extensive experience with the all titanium Vanguard. Um, that was our go-to non-cobalt chrome implant. Uh, titanium soft on poly uh, is not a great idea, uh, idea, especially in the hip, but on durable poly, um, it, it did pretty well, and that may be partly due to the inertness of titanium and the biocompatibility. Uh, now we have um, a super hard, uh, durable uh, surface, along with the biocompatibility of titanium. And the, the great thing is that all of this fits within one tray. The one tray system uh, really simplifies our life uh, in the ASC and in the hospital. And... Um, uh, it turns out, interestingly, that uh, the one tray manufacturer is in our backyard when we didn't know that for the last 10 years until this recently came out in the last year or two uh, near our office. Um, here's Dr. Bolo. He's pumped because he's got one tray. He's excited about the cost, the simplization, the simplicity of sterilization, uh, less room for error, less inventory, less space taken up uh, in the surgery center or the OR at the hospital. And especially uh, here we have uh, fewer workers' comp claims due to less uh, tray hauling. And I would argue that uh, arthroplasty is a team sport and we need to take care of both ourselves and uh, all of our team members. And so this is a great uh, way to simplify things. Even the packaging is smaller and that uh, makes a difference nowadays. Looking at when I first came, uh, started 10 years ago in Mooresville, uh, looking at what the inventory looked like, it was pretty darn streamlined. It was, you know, just a couple options. Now there's 10 companies, they each have a warehouse full of inventory. And so smaller packaging, uh, universal components, uh, as opposed to rights and lefts, um, can provide great simplicity and still fantastic outcomes. And we'll look more at that. Um, so again, the evolution of stability, um, you can go from a congruent CR to an ultra PS non-boxed, but ultra congruent implant that comes in, uh, with titanium tray or all poly. You can easily convert intraoperatively to a PS box if you need constraint. And uh, it's super simple. We open a small peel pack that has a few instruments, a, a reamer and a clip on a in a trial. And um, it's one ream uh, to create the box, two Ronger bites, and you're ready to go. And you can do that on the fly, minimal instrumentation change, minimal um, cost increase. Uh, and it's really a fantastic option. You can also stem the tibia. So uh, bad bone or a uni conversion or what uh, even simple revisions, uh, you've got a great option there. In the future, I think we'll see um, the, the femur, uh, the, the PS femur is stem ready and those will be coming out soon. I think we'll get tibial augments uh, on the market soon as well, where this will be a, a useful platform from everything from primary to a fair number of our revisions. And uh, also, it's a bone sparing procedure. Uh, here is up in the corner a, um, a chart of how much bone is taken with different common implants. And it's really uh, the, the most bone sparing. And I love that it's not a box uh, to reduce um, fracture stress risers. 
Um, in the past, if we needed to all of a sudden, you know, a couple times a year bail on a primary to a constraint, if they had the kind of MCL repair 40 years ago, and it's just not not robust, and I don't trust it. Um, we're going to switch to a constraint. We got to open all new sets. We're our price just tripled, um, and uh, it's a lot of extra work and headache. When here you can create a great result for uh, your patient uh, with minimal additional effort. So the universal femoral components. Um, I know the tibia was based off of uh, tibial. Um, uh, sizes from a ton of specimens. The femoral implant has the patented double Q angle, which just means the patella tracks great on either side. Again, this cuts your inventory in half without any compromise to the patient. Here is a paper we've just submitted um, looking at close to a thousand knees, uh, total knees and close to 700 unis looking at the patellofemoral joint, anterior knee pain and uh, stair function scores. And uh, Ignoring the patella with multiple um, recorded uh, cartilage wares in, in our unis, as well as selective resurfacing, both with anatomic sided implants and this universal femur, we saw no difference uh, in any group across these. Uh, so it's, it's a great implant and we've had great results uh, with very few uh, resurfacings. Um, I've loved the all poly tibia in the, in the outpatient space. Uh, it's super efficient. It's super, uh, it's a price performer. It may be the, uh, we would call it the new old gold standard. Um, it is uh, uh, bio-friendly, infection-friendly, uh, bone-friendly, and we put all our tibias in in one piece anyway, so why not use it, uh, eliminate one more modular junction? Though I will say their um, locking mechanism with screw is super robust and dependable. Um, so lo again, lots of great options, whatever your flavor is. If you want to put this knee in with the robot, you can do it. Um, you can, um, lots of options. So here's my first case uh, of the Orem. It came out in April. Uh, or, or came to me uh, available in April, um, did my first case. So here's the three month x-ray. Uh, so an all poly tibia with a ti uh, titanium aurum femur, uh, is th could this be a new paradigm of simplicity, biocompatibility, lightweight, low cost implant? Um, I think I am definitely moving that direction. I would, uh, initially when this came out, I would have maybe said, well, what, what problem am I trying to fix in my total knees? Because quote unquote, they all do great, like all surgeons say. Um, but uh, seeing more and more evidence against cobalt chrome, even in the well-performing knee, um, and more and more uh, confidence in the arm implant with the friendliness of titanium and the hardness and durability of the surface, uh, which may have uh, future um, wear and uh, infection prop, uh, uh, benefits is definitely appealing. So the classic knee system, it's got all the options you need and none that you don't. It's cost, space, and complexity savings help you, your institution, your staff, and your patient. And uh, I do think that the future may be golden. Thank you. Dr. Lackey, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, highlighting the classic knee system, one tray, some of the different bearing <laughs> options, and uh, Orem in your uh, private practice and ASC environment. Really appreciate it. We'll come back to some questions that I'm sure that some of our participants will want to ask of you in a later time. Um, I now want to reintroduce Dr. David uh, Doherty from UT Health at Houston. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about his indications for the use of Orem technology and total knee arthroplasty in his, uh, in his academic environment at UT Health. Thank you very much, Dr. Pelt. Glad to be on this call, and I think this is an exciting topic to talk about. Um, I'm uh, from down in Houston, Texas, and uh, quickly, my disclosure is total joint orthopedics consultant. Um, and so briefly, why, why I use TJO, why I use RM technology. Um, I've, I've, I grew up with TJO, essentially. I used it in residency. I used it in fellowship. And I think it's very a truly surgeon-centered company. I think that they care a lot about their surgeons. They care a lot about their patients, their core values of optimizing efficiency, and they also provide um, tremendous educational support, and they, I think, recognize the need for uh, training the next generation of surgeons, and um, I think TJO truly does add value to my practice. 
So with Orem specifically, um, I, I think that they uh, continue along this uh, trend of being patient and surgeon centered. Um, I think that they are trying to address significant biomechanical issues and real world issues that we see in, in our clinics and see uh, with our patients on a day to day basis. Uh, just to reiterate the um, the uh, more detailed version that Dr. Pelt went over, but um, I think Aurum technology is is certainly exciting, and I think that the way that it is applied to the titanium is the true um, the 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 true uh, breakthrough of the Aurum technology. The ion blasting and the um, the ballistic um, bonding of the of the Aurum layer is. I think excellent for longevity and clearly it offers significant biomechanical advantages. So a typical patient that I see and we all see daily in our clinics is um, a 59 uh, year old male coming in. He's got bilateral knee pain. He's been being conservatively managed by a primary care doctor for several years, was told to wait, wait it out as long as he could, wait until he was 60 to get a total knee replacement. Comes to our clinic, he's tried everything, he's looking for total knee replacement, and he comes in. So a uh, typical patient that I'm seeing with the residents and the fellows. So he is here for a specific reason. So we're, our job is to find the specific aspects of this patient to customize his treatment plan, make sure everything is going to go as good as it can for him. So he is um, unremarkable on exam. He's fairly typical. The most uh, remarkable aspects are going to be his BMI. He's a little bit overweight. And he also has mild eczema on his wrists and elbows. And I bring that up. I know that there's been a lot of talk about the possibility of hypersensitivity, allergy with metal ions. And, and, and I too believe that we don't really know how to explain it effectively at this point. And perhaps this is something to do with sensitivity just to the metal ions. It might not be an immune modulated phenomenon, but I do think that um, certain patients do raise my, uh, raise my concern level and patients that do have some cutaneous findings or other signs of hypersensitivity, I do take a little bit harder look at and consider other bearing surfaces other than just cobalt chrome. Um, and then finally, I think an important thing, the social history, this patient works as a laborer on construction sites. He plans to work for many more years. He's an active individual and he relies on his body, his knees for his uh, livelihood. So this patient has in-stage osteoarthritis of his bilateral knees. Our plan is for a staged bilateral total knee arthroplasty. And so now we want to uh, optimize our chances for long-term success for our patient. My biggest considerations, as we just discussed, BMI, his social job profession, uh, his age, and then the skin findings as well. What will help us come to the proper conclusion for the patient, always looking at the literature, looking at evidence and seeing what um, you know, trends are out there. So a classic paper we've already discussed, um, just to reiterate, um, people are starting to see the problems with cobalt chrome. And if over half of the retrieval implants are up to 98% of them have scratching and have significant surface damage on them, that's a problem. Um, the highest incidence of these retrievals having significant roughness and scratches on them were in patients that had them removed for aseptic loosening, you know, so perhaps a correlation there. Uh, then also this surface roughness and significant abrasions were correlated with patients' weight and the AP congruity of implants. I'm a user of the ultra congruent implants. I think it's an excellent option, especially in the TJO lineup. And so that's certainly a consideration for me as well. The more surface contact on those cobalt chrome implants can lead to more significant findings. Another paper more recent, looking at um, another biomechanical aspect of, of surface roughness and scratching in cobalt chrome implants versus ceramic or other femoral components. Uh, there's a logarithmic uh, increase in the surface roughness during the first 1,000 cycles uh, in simulated load testing. After that, it's a linear relationship. It continues to worsen. The surface material lost is also not reabsorbed readily. It creates third body wear particles, and this is going to exacerbate the scratching and the roughness of the surface of these implants. And these scratches is in this roughness in the uh, cobalt chrome Im implants were not observed in the other bearing surfaces that were looked at in this study. 
And then finally to, again, um, kind of come back to the point of the problematic aspects of having uh, cobalt in your bloodstream and the potential complications it can cause to your just systematic, uh, the effects on your, on your entire body. I thought that one of the most in incredible quotes from this paper was that systemic cobalt dissemination can result in brain hypometabolism and atrophy in patients with levels of cobalt in their blood as low as 1.1 parts per billion and in urine as low as 4.1 parts per billion are reported to have cobalt encephalopathy. And as y'all saw in the chart, that Dr. Pelt presented earlier, there were a lot of patients that were significantly above those levels. Even patients with single unilateral total knee arthroplasty had detectable cobalt levels in their blood and in their urine. So this is a, this is a problem. This is something that patients are being exposed to. This can be, you know, this is an iatrogenic problem that we are creating for these patients. And if it's a problem, it should be addressed. So I think that the considerations that we had in our patient uh, high BMI, his job status, his age, his skin findings. This discussion with the residents and the fellows, it leads to alternate bearing surface. We should not use cobalt chromium in this patient. And for a patient like this, who's looking for knee replacement that's gonna be uh, wear resistant, have increased hardness, is abrasion resistant, and avoids the sensitizing metals, and it's gonna last for a long time for him, Orem is an excellent option. So that's exactly what he got. He had his bilateral knee replacements done about two months apart from each other. And he is now doing great. He's four months out on the, on the left one. He's two months out on the right. He's back at work. He's on a construction site. He's doing everything he needs to do. He's improving. All of his post-operative x-rays have been consistent. Been no changes, no early failure, no poly wear, no other concerning signs of loosening that, that to speak of. Um, so some of my conclusions, I think that Cobalt chromium is becoming more and more of a problematic uh, aspect of, of joint replacement. I think that the um, jury is still out. I think that there's many more studies that need to be done, but it is certainly a area of concern that I think we should all be considering for our patients. And when there do uh, become things that are potentially better, I think that RM fits the bill and it offers characteristics important for all of our patients, particularly high demand patients. And I think that Orem's great because it is a trusted implant design. It's simply a change in the coating of the implant, and it expands upon a spectrum of total knee products um, that uh, allow surgeons and trainees and everybody I work with to tailor custom treatment plans to, to patients. And so I uh, enjoy using Orem, and I enjoy using TJO, and I think it's a great combination and a great solution for a potential problem that we've uh, not fully addressed yet. That was great. Thanks. Dave, that's a fantastic summary of uh, a great clinical case presentation and some of your indications, some of the interesting conversations you even have with your trainees about uh, indications for alternative options and materials and uh, um, properties. I'm going to go back to address two of the outstanding questions. I've answered a few in the live Q&A um, by typing. I have a slide or two that might help us to kind of address two questions that are being asked. One of them is the head-to-head -head comparisons of more conventionally deposited Tainai coatings. The second question that was being asked is, there are some papers that are showing failures of Tainai coatings in clinical practice. How can we be sure that Orem addresses the challenges that we have seen in those other examples? While I'm pulling up my slides, maybe I would let the two of you guys address how are you rationalizing these um, potential concerns in your own practice and the decision that you made uh, when you looked at what data is available in the early tests and stuff, how did you choose that Orem was a superior option and why it was okay for you to use on your own patients in your own practice? So I, I think that the um, biomechanical data and the scratch testing on the Orem product was, um, it, it was, it, it was significant for me in terms of making that determination. I think that when you look at uh, the ability of the surface to maintain after significant attempts to abrase it and, and essentially destroy it, um, I, I think that that's um, exactly what I'm looking for because there has been history of some surface coatings not being quite as uh, bonded to the substrate. And I, I think that when you look at some of the more popular um, bonded elements out there, I think that having 
essentially a bonded zone where there's a transition zone where there is interdigitation. I know that's the wrong word, but there is interdigitation between the two materials and the bonding has a more secure um, uh, fit to the substrate. And, and so that's a motivating factor that the, the specific way it is bonded is I think very important to me. And I think it demonstrates the um, durability of it. So I'm just, uh, so Dr. Lackey, maybe you could give your impression. I'm gonna show these uh, few examples of comparisons. Uh, yeah, I agree all that's been said. I, you know, our, our experience in the past was with plain titanium and we like the friendliness to that. And if you have really great poly, that's, that's good. But we, what I didn't wanna do is introduce a new problem. But having seen, um, uh, the biomechanical testing, uh, the material I've been, uh, I was, I didn't go a hundred percent in, but I'm, I'm moving more and more towards that, uh, uh, of being all in. Um, we're also, um, I've seen a little bit behind the scenes, um, as we've been, um, uh, working on developing this, the, the last frontier of cobalt chrome in the hip has been the, uh, dual mobility, um, um, but it's better to put a cobalt chrome liner in than to dislocate um acutely but um uh look and watch this space for um this arm technology coming out uh in dual mobility hip as well yeah that's a great uh glimpse into the future i agree uh somebody asked earlier also porous or cementless fixations also i think coming out um so uh here's a, just a couple examples of the different ways that tainai is being added as well as the only other real true alternative, at least in the United States. We, we aren't gonna talk about ceramics, which aren't FDA approved in the United States, but these all do exist in the marketplace today. What is different is really, in my opinion, this ballistically bonded zone of this Tainai five micron surface uh, transformation additive, um, but ballistically bonded zone instead of baked on coatings and the diffusion layers um, that can be exceedingly thin. And so the example that somebody said about the issue of the softness and the sort of catastrophic failures that have been shown, almost all of those have been demonstrated in the issue of either like the one that I showed of aseptic loosening and the abrasive third body wear that can occur to that very, very, very thin and soft surface transformation layer that existed on that particular implant or other implants, or has been in catastrophic failures where there's been polyethylene failure and the actual implant rubs on another piece of metal. Um, I don't know if anybody has used this particular, you can scratch it with a bovie, you can nick it uh, if you hit it accidentally with, uh, with your mallet. Um, uh, when we've done the uh, sort of try to, try to damage this surface layer um, in my own hands and seeing the lab test, the, the reason that I'm using it um, is because it's really been uh, truly better uh, than the other things that I've had in my hands before. Um, granted, it's early, I, um, I've used it since February. Um, we just got an answer or a question. Um, is there any patient or situation that you think ORM is not the best option? Stated another way, are you using this for all TKAs? And if not, why? Uh, the answer for me is I'm using it in all TKAs. 100% of my patients get ORM. Uh, I've eliminated cobalt chrome uh, for about three years from my primary total neoarthroplasty practice. And when ORM came available, it was a easy solution for me. I have partners that choose to spend money on alternative things to get at um, improvements in outcomes, perhaps in total arthroplasty that also perhaps haven't been demonstrated um, in the literature to fully make a difference, like uh, robotics, navigation, and others. We can change alignment. Um, I'm choosing to invest that extra uh, cost currently, um, and it may not always be an extra cost, by the way, as we sort of eliminate uh, cobalt chrome as an offering. We just saw that in total hip arthroplasties. It's really not a price differential in most centers anymore. Because the only other thing that's offered is ceramic heads. Well, I think that's probably where the future is heading in total neoarthroplasty as well. Currently, is there a cost differential? Probably. And I'm choosing to invest that in a potentially improved, uh, durable, um, uh, a superior uh, material property for my patients. And this is just one last example, sort of showing um, the different options that exist, uh, the thicknesses, as you can see. Um, the strongest property uh, that we've been able to demonstrate with this type of technology is with Orem compared to others. And really, I haven't seen significant downsides. The softer base metal uh, concerning in some of the other implants, the very thin and weaker strength surface transformation or surface coating uh, being the issues with the other uh, failures that have been shown. So 
I get, I agree with some of the people's concerns more to come as far as the long-term clinical uh, results. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that is the current uh, technology that we have. Um, let's see, let's go back. Am I sharing anymore or no? Doesn't look like it. Let's go back to a couple more questions. Um, yeah, so I can, I can yeah. talk about this question from Dr. Peterson, who yeah. is asking um, if there are, uh, you know, the specific types of conversations we're having in the clinic with patients around cobalt chrome, or um, are, there, are they asking about bearing surfaces, basically? And I think that uh, there are certainly patients that do come in that, that are educated enough and, and do discuss bearing surfaces specifically, but I think that um, most patients ask questions related to bearing surfaces that are uh, potentially questions that are about bearing surface that they don't realize are necessarily about the bearing surface. And I think our job as a surgeon is to um, interpret those questions that the patient and judging their, their expectation level and their uh, specific patient factors and, and activity levels to, to choose uh, the most appropriate bearing surface for them considering all of those um, options. I mean, certainly I'm going to accommodate any, um, anything a patient is specifically looking for, but in my practice, I, I, uh, I still do uh, put in some cobalt chrome knees. However, I'm limiting it as much as possible and it's becoming fewer and fewer for me. But um, I think that, you know, every patient wants everything. They want the, you know, best knee that's going to last as long as it possibly can. And it's going to, uh, you know, not cause a secondary problem for them. And I think uh, Orem represents that so far in, in, in early experience, for sure. I mentioned it um, earlier, cost. Um, Dr. Lackey, could you tell me a little bit about your rationalization or justification of alternative bearings and the increased cost that manufacturers typically apply to those uh, sort of novel um, implant technologies? And how do, you, how do you do that and justify that in your practice? Yeah, so, so again, whether you own an ASC or are involved with a hospital or managed services agreement or academic center, those kind of things, uh, cost does affect you, especially as we move more and more into uh, higher Medicare um, groups and um, bundled payments and different kinds of stuff, cost containment. Um, for, for me, the TJO system with the options of the all poly, the, the simplicity of converting if I need to constrain or some something, um, it, it's super price performer cost effective system with low headache, low inventory, um, and, and just simple. So yes, the the new the alternative bearing surface does add a cost, but it's significantly less than before. And it was it was painful to you know say, hey, I don't really think you have a metal allergy, but you don't like cheap jewelry, so we'll use this you know six thousand dollar implant. Uh, and, and that's a total game changer um, with pricing um, with TJO. And you mentioned it in your in your talk, but maybe just go over it one more time. The efficiency of the instrumentation. You talk about inventory with the universal design. The instrumentation, that same implant, I think that you're referring to with that ex, you know very high cost. When they bring in the instrument trays to do that knee replacement, in my setting, it was probably at least six and maybe nine trays that they had to sterilely process to do one knee replacement. Um, what do you notice different with using TJO? Yeah, there, there are some that we kind of make fun of, um, you know, with rights and lefts and just asymmetric everything. And the inventory is just massive for us. Uh, uh, you know, our, our predecessor knee that I used um, before um, was the, the Vanguard and but in our ASC, we had already kind of done the one tray system before the one tray came out. So we were pumped about the one tray and the, the better improved instruments, and they're fantastic. Um, but we uh, we do even additional things like um, peel packing the femoral trials each individually and peel packing each set of poly trials individually. So we have one tray of tools, one tray of uh, cutting jigs and blocks for the femur and tibia. And then we peel pack our trials. And so um, 
So we love to keep it super, super streamlined. And this system has made it even easier um, to when the oh shoot moments happen uh, and you need something on backup, it's right there and it's an effortless transition. For us, it's peel one, um, you know, one extra little set and, you know, one ream and bam, I've got a PS constrained implant ready to go uh, at, at a very fair cost. Yeah, that's a great point. There's a couple more questions asking us about costs, and I really think it's the same. I can't give you all a number. Uh, I think it's dependent on hospital contracts, just like every answer that any surgeon would generically provide you. In my own experience, I think it's just like Dr. Lackey just said, it's a lot less than what the alternative is. And it's not just the implant cost when you're talking to hospital administrators. You know, yes, we're talking about lifelong revision risks and uh superior bearings. We want it to be durable and last and decrease infections and revisions, all that kind of stuff. These are right now all theoretical without proven uh, clinical data to prove it. Um, but there's the whole other thing that Dr. Lackey was just talking about, the efficiency, the reduced inventory, the reduced number of instrument trays and sets, the number of sterilization uh, units that have to go through the sterile processor. Um, it's For me, it's I use the one tray, it's one wrap around one instrument tray and our sterile processing loves it. We can go to the ASC or the main hospital. It makes no difference. And with this current you know, pandemic and those labor shortages, we've had a lot of travelers and different techs in there. It has made the efficiency and the OR so much better because it's simple. And their words over and over again is, this was the best and easiest knee replacement I've ever had a chance to do because it is so intelligently designed and efficient and streamlined one tray for the entire surgery. It's pretty, pretty awesome. And that's a cost savings um, in addition to the efficiency with this SP as well. Dr. Doherty, any last uh, thoughts from you? Um, no, I just think that this is uh, an exciting move forward. I know that, you know, it's been publicized, but I think this is, you know, a, a good move forward in terms of bearing technology. And, um, you know, at the very least, it's pushing people to look at cobalt chrome in a different way and uh, recognize that it potentially is not the perfect bearing um, surface that that it, it, it once was. And not, not to say that it hasn't uh, had its time and done a pretty great job for, for what we've expected. But like we mentioned now, now's the time to start tackling that 15 to 20% group of patients and looking for um, ideas that are gonna push this uh, you know, joint replacement uh, field further and uh, truly optimize it all. And, and I think Orem uh, represents a, a stride at that for sure. Hey Pelt, it's Bolo. I'm really sorry I'm late. I apologize to everybody. I had some travel challenges, but I was able to listen to you guys. Couldn't, said if it, couldn't have said it any better. Um, and um, really agree with the, the efficiency side pair, paired with all the advantages of the bearings. But apologize to the folks that signed in and, and me not being able to be there with you guys. But I've listened to, to hear these guys doing a tremendous job. <laughs> Great job. Thanks, Bolo. Cameo <laughs> at the end. I love it. Yeah, nice so, job. yeah, yeah but uh, please, you have the last word. But, I, but you, as I listen, you guys really hit all the key points and the reasons why this is such an interesting t technology and, and you know, option for you. And for us, not just not just for us surgeons, but obviously for the patients. Great points. So this concludes the uh, hour session that we had uh, for this. Um, this uh, will be available for later viewing, I think, through the Total Joint Orthopedics uh, YouTube channel, their website, and uh, likely through Orthopedics this week, uh, who is the um, host of the uh, session today. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Bolognese, at the very end for his uh, 10 seconds of effort as well as Dr. Doherty and Dr. Lackey. Um, a really great conversation. I hope this answers some of the questions. More to come. We'll be publishing our clinical results, obviously. That is our duty um, as uh, you know, early adopters of a new technology to report. And uh, honest reporting is important to all of us uh, as, uh, as well. And uh, look forward to the future. It's exciting. And uh, maybe we have found the new gold standard. Let's hope. So thanks, everybody.